These are some of the most war-stricken memories of Soviet veterans during their brutal war against the Germans. From the agony of death to the joy of victory, these soldiers never lost hope. Let's begin. Our commander was an experienced soldier and understood that during a war, soldiers needed to rest. Without rest, it would be challenging to maintain discipline. It wasn't something we could tell the young recruits. They might get the wrong idea, thinking we were constantly engaged in shooting and throwing grenades day and night. We couldn't let them think that. Sometimes, we allowed the enemy to retreat, taking their weapons with them. In August 1941, on the grounds of the Kustanay chemical fiber plant, Konstantin Sergei IV recalled how they established a shell factory. By October, we had built sheds to protect the machines from the rain, and from November onwards, we used spindle oil to keep the machines running smoothly. One worker, who brought materials from the warehouse, warned that if the boys continued to work outside throughout the winter, they wouldn't survive the scorching summer. In response to this, the director decided to recruit a group of students, assign them to the machines, and provide them with ample food supplies. They were overjoyed with their new roles and the trust placed in them. Hunger was no longer a constant threat. My young workers performed admirably and met the production targets. They were only 15 and 16 years old. Three winters later, after enduring the harsh cold, more than a hundred of my young workers were laid to rest in the Kustanay City Cemetery. It wasn't until the summer of 1944 that the machines found shelter under a warm roof, as remembered by Bozibatai. We had covered a distance of 15 kilometers when we received orders to halt. The entire battalion rushed into the forest to answer the call of nature. We didn't pick specific spots, we just sat wherever we could, taking our time, smoking, and chatting. Tata Rashid placed burdock leaves on a fallen tree and sat down with a serious expression. He paused for a moment, as if pondering, and then admitted that he couldn't recall his aunt's face. I, too, made an effort to remember but couldn't. Concerned voices rose among my fellow soldiers, and some of them admitted they couldn't remember their parents' faces either. We silently reached a consensus that Rashid was the brightest mind among us in the battalion, which remained a rather modest group of 80 soldiers. After enduring 20 days of continuous attacks and bombings, we were tasked with rebuilding the battalion, according to Konstantin Dukanian's recollection. Our unit was stationed in Romania, where the war seemed distant, and we had transitioned to a more peaceful routine. Even with our presence, the female population still dominated the aria. Romanian women found themselves expecting children, yet there were no disputes or complaints followed with the commandant's office. I requested the administration secretary to issue a certificate stating that a Romanian citizen was generously gifting me the bicycle as a symbol of the deep friendship between our nations, all in the spirit of their country's liberation. Demobilized soldiers underwent a thorough inspection, during which all their civilian belongings were confiscated. They examined my certificate meticulously, it was written in Romanian, and understanding it without an interpreter was impossible. I firmly explained to them that it was a gift, a symbol of the strong friendship between nations, and they believed me. For five years, I had been riding my Adler bicycle around my hometown until it was stolen near a store, leaving only the chain and lock behind. Seven years later, I spotted my bicycle near the police station. It had become even more beautiful, evidently taken care of by someone else. During a visit by an ensemble from Moldova to my city, I shared the bicycle story with them. They translated the old certificate for me, revealing the inscription, one old fool sells this item and the other guy buys it. Who's the wiser of the two? Only God knows. All of this was officially certified with the seal of a veterinary hospital. Sergei Prokopenko reminisced about our days watching the Germans. We observed them throughout the day and identified a gap between two of their units where there was no solid line of defense between two machine gun positions. There was a 100-meter gap, a vulnerable area without a combat outpost where we could infiltrate the enemy's rear at night and capture Germans for interrogation. The soldiers in our company were Moldovan, Blatnoy Biaja, Prostoy Bayaza, brothers from Odessa. Nogotok and Senior Lieutenant Jiravlev were equipped for reconnaissance. The battalion commander quietly blessed them all, taking his kettle, spoon, and flask. We double-checked the time, confirmed the landmarks for the exit, inspected our uniforms again, and drew lots with matches. 
the senior lieutenant led the way toward the German machine guns, opening fire from both sides. Flares were launched into the sky, signaling the start of our mission. The following day, at the designated time, we ignited two flares and initiated firing from both sides to divert the attention of the Germans away from the area where a group of our soldiers intended to cross into their territory. On that particular night, we didn't wait for our reconnaissance group again. We swiftly organized and equipped a fresh team, initiating fire from both sides once more. The Germans, in response, unleashed a barrage of fire from two machine guns. Flares were dispatched into the night sky and our group commenced their mission. However, just 10 minutes later, they returned with a captive German and a Moldavian comrade. The battalion commander arrived, and without delay, the prisoner was dispatched urgently to the division headquarters. The Moldavian soldier, however, staunchly refused to respond to the commander's inquiries and consumed all the water we provided. He claimed to have gone without food or drink for two days. We quickly brought him some food, but he didn't eat hastily. Instead, he savored each bite. Eventually, the Moldavian began to share his story. We safely reached the road without encountering any issues and concealed ourselves in the bushes. We patiently awaited the right moment and seized a liaison soldier passing by on a bicycle. He didn't resist. The senior lieutenant instructed us to restrain the German and stay hidden in the bushes throughout the day. The Germans moved cautiously forming a thin chain along the forest's edges, avoiding the open ground and congregating in the nearby small forests. As night fell, the movement of tanks, self-propelled vehicles, armored personnel carriers, and tractors with guns commenced, as described by the senior lieutenant. Our battalion now faced two infantry divisions, consisting of 70 tanks, 40 self-propelled vehicles, approximately 200 armored personnel carriers, and about 50 guns, an overwhelming force against our unit. While we were crawling, the Germans spotted us, but they refrained from shooting and instead blinded us with the headlights of their armored vehicles. I veered to the right alongside a German and expressed my gratitude. He proved to be resourceful as he led us into a ravine, ultimately saving us from harm. Surprisingly, the German turned out to be timid, remaining silent throughout the journey and offering no resistance. Meanwhile, the Germans were urging us forward from behind. When gunfire erupted, we immediately dropped to the ground and continued crawling. On that same night, the Germans employed nighttime battle tactics, catching us off guard. Our battalion possessed only six small caliber guns, which the Germans swiftly dismantled, destroying the battalion's position in a mere seven minutes. It was a tactic of surprise, as the Germans had not previously engaged in nighttime combat. Moldovan and I found ourselves captured by the Germans. I felt bewildered while he was covered in dirt but miraculously unearthed. The Germans did not keep a close watch on us. Instead, they gestured the direction we should follow. We marched in a line of two, with 30 or 40 men, as if we were heading to reassemble our battalion along the way to our column. Blatnoy and Postnoy were also brought to us by the Germans, who informed us that the senior lieutenant and Nogotok had been executed by the Germans upon discovering Komsomol and party membership cards in their pockets. Around lunchtime, we arrived at a vast field where a German military field kitchen stood with two large cauldrons. We were provided with food before being directed on our way. After lunch, we seized an opportunity to escape, while the remainder of the column obediently continued into the German-controlled area. To this day, I struggle to comprehend this phenomenon. Perhaps they were seeking a peaceful and tranquil existence. We were led through the Siberian wilderness for hours, eventually reaching a remote village by evening, where we received both food and an assault rifle. The elderly man and woman indicated the direction we should go by pointing towards a lake surrounded by reeds. We followed their guidance, circling around the lake and walking for another three kilometers until we finally found our group. Upon arrival, we were immediately sent to the back. The man from Alte who accompanied us seemed unhurried. Along the way, we managed to get some rest, eat, and encountered a grumpy sergeant in the village of Lutovo. After inspecting our documents, he directed us to continue on to the village of Archipelago, which we didn't reach until the following day. The lieutenant we encountered there looked completely pale. His eyebrows appeared both intimidating and strangely amusing. 
He questioned us extensively about the whereabouts of our weapons, how we ended up in German custody, and the duration of our captivity. Eventually, he let us go in peace, providing each of us with the necessary documentation. After wandering around the rear for three or more days, our cunning companion led us back to his company's location, calling us fools. Despite our hunger, the most important thing was that we were alive. In someone else's platoon, we were frequently assigned the task of retrieving wounded soldiers from the battlefield and conducting night reconnaissance by force. This was how it unfolded. The three of us would crawl towards the German trenches, throwing grenades towards areas where we heard German voices. Then, like worms in the rain, we would burrow into the ground due to the intense gunfire from both sides. So there you have it. Thanks a bunch for watching. Be sure to leave a comment, and before you leave, why not like and subscribe? See you next time.